Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Um, um, I'm very happy to be part of this panel where we're talking about the, the sort of the peripheries of the European modernism um, and um, and thinking about questions of time and temporality with these geopolitical questions and and, 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 uh, and the idea of the global periphery. Um, so I will be talking about two, let's say, peripheral authors uh, today. One is Robert Walter, a Swiss author uh, from the, the first half of the 20th century, and his contemporary, uh, Ahmed Hamdi Tampunar. Tampunar, um, try to, I, I, I assume that most of you are not familiar with this name, so try to keep that in mind. Uh, well, there are other authors than Orhan Pamuk in Turkish literature. Also, you can you know, mention that sometimes when the, the, the conversation comes to that. Um, and Tamponar, who, um, who is also, um, okay, Robert Walser is a, is, a, is, a, is a peripheral figure in the European modernism because um, um, in a way, because of his, his um, let's say, different um, um, way of expressing himself in German, um, and because of many other reasons, because he didn't write in a, in a systematic way, um, he he sort of remained in the periphery of, of of modernism. Although he was very influential on on uh, on, a, on a figure like Franz Kafka, for example, um, not much has been written on on Robert Walter, interestingly, um, and and of course Tom Pinar being a, a a peripheral figure to uh, to to Europe and and European modernism. Um, so I will be. Uh, trying to bring the, these two writers together um, today, and and their the in their idea or image or tr trope of clock and how they use it. Um, written in 1907 and based closely on Walser's own experiences, the assistant tells the story of a young man hired by an engineer who hopes to make his fortune as the inventor of an advertising clock. It's a master and slave story of a boastful but incompetent inventor and his assistant who was overwhelmed by the absurdity of odd inventions and countless business letters. Tom Pinar's novel, The Time Regulation Institute, depicts a similar atmosphere of administration, inventions for social engineering and humor born out of the conflict between a relentless innovator, again, and his uninformed assistant. Heidi Yerdal, the, the uh, perplexed anti-hero, the, the protagonist of the novel, unwittingly gets involved with the fictional Time Regulation Institute, or we can translate it as the Clock Setting Institute, um, which aims to modernize every aspect of citizens' lives, including regulating their watches and clocks, making sure that everyone shares the exact time, that no one runs forward or late. Despite their linguistic and literary, di despite their different linguistic and literary background, Walser and Tamponar have the affinity of a playful style and humorous approach to the calibrating urge of modernity without taking recourse to straightforward satire. It's a stress on the alienating regulation that informs their approach to the matter of temporality. They wrote at, a, at the historical moment when the very division between the old and the new was consolidated and a cult of the new brought together with it a sense of loss of what had been. Um, the sense of the present as incessantly always already passing created the need to capture the past through remembrance where literature, philo philosophy, and historiography were called upon to meet. Despite their many differences and their apparent unawareness of each other's work, I argued that their sustained connection may reveal certain affinities between their thought, which may in turn illuminate certain aspects of modernism, pointing to yet more avenues of approaching it through and together with a non-Western canon writer and thinker. Walser's novel, and I'll, I'll mention briefly, um, I want to spend more time on Tom Pinar here. Um, the Assistant is based on a, on a master-slave structure between a deranged, incompetent, arrogant entrepreneur and his loyal assistant. The Assistant, Joseph Marty, enjoys a pampered existence in the home of his employer but is never paid, and finds himself in a position of uncomfortable intimacy within a household being destroyed by bankruptcy and failure. Joseph comes from the city, where he has been living in poverty, to take a post in the country at the Tobler's on a small town on Lake Zurich. Engineer Tobler was, employed, was earlier employed in a factory, but now hopes to make his fortune as the inventor of an advertising clock. We follow the story of the assistant from spring until winter, when he abandons his position and leaves the Tobler household, which is ruined by debts. The invention in question, the advertising clock, is a decorative clock which Herr Tobler the engineer Tobler intends to franchise to railway station managers, restaurateurs, hotel owners, and the like. Quote, 
A genuinely quite fetching clock like this, Joseph calculated, would be hung up, for example, in a streetcar or several, in particularly conspicuous locations, so that all those riding and traveling would be able to set their pocket watches by it and always know how early or late in the day it was. And it has the advantage of, okay, thank you, my iPad. It has the advantage <laughs> of, of being associated with the institution of advertising. The clock not only serves to ensure the synchronicity of citizens, it also has a dimension of profit to it, including to the alluding to the capitalist formulation, time is money. The calibration of time is not just projecting it into space and special measurement, as Bar Bergson argues, but also giving it an exchange value, depriving it of its lived nature. Its inventor, Hartogler, is a caricature of the early 20th century engineer that idealizes pompous manifestations of machines. Just think about the, um, the, the L'Exposition Universelle, the world fairs at that time um, in early 20th century, and celebration of the material culture. And Walser wrote this novel only seven years after <coughs> the, the famous Exposition in Paris in, in 1900. So the mechanistic world view epitomized in the advertising clock immobilizes our experience as occurring in a temporal flow. It prevents us from grasping the temporal nature of reality. The advertising clock represents the strange timelessness of mechanistic thinking. Hartogler is only interested in timeless and immobile, immobile machines that bring profit. To him, his assistant Joseph is a mere autom automaton who is supposed to function like the advertising clock. Joseph, on the other hand, describes the clock as, quote, Invisible, visible apparition. It's like a small or large child. He knows mark the contradictory adjectives he uses. Like a strong, like a headstrong child that requires constant self-sacrificing care and does not even thank one for watching over, uncle. The clock is a spoiled child of technology and science that turns I guess is, is inventor here. The next clock I would like to discuss belongs to the protagonist of Tampanar's novel, um, Hyrir Dahl, an anti-hero who is unable to keep up with the demands of the modernized society and ridiculed for being old-fashioned and irrational. The novel is the memoir of Harry who constructs his life around watches and clocks he has owned or repaired. Among these, he mentions his father's pocket watch with a compass, a pointer to Qibla, and a calendar. Qibla is where, um, where you turn to when you want to pray. Um, he describes it as a quote, bizarre sort of watch that displays, displays all types, be it oriental or occidental, existent and non-existent, unquote. The watch does not function properly because no one could repair all its multifarious functions. Hyrie adds, quote, half of it remained in abeyance, like a house of which only the middle floor is used, unquote. This imaginary but extraordinarily diverse and somewhat uncanny watch does not measure time but times, plural and interpenetrating inter temporalities. It's a counter model to standardized universal time, attuned to the unique rhythms of multiple times, not only Eastern and Western, but existent and non-existent, as uh, the protagonist says. It represents an always already lost ideal of a heterogeneous unity of ancient cultural dualism and of the past and the present. The father's watch symbolizes a dream that has been devised once, but now a failure, an irreparable discordance. Hyvi is a man of a past era, Raised in an old poor neighborhood of Istanbul, his family home was right next to Mihramat Mosque, uh, an old mosque. The special placement of his parents' home parallels the uncanny atmosphere of the early years of his life. An enchanted clock that haunts his house, a visionary who tells tales from the afterworld, an alchemist, grotesque atmosphere of a coffee house, the association of spiritualists, they all create a mystic environment that comes to an end with the arrival of Halit the Regulator, the, the entrepreneur here or we can think about it as the arrival of the Republican reforms. Um, Harry divides his life into two periods, before and after the biggest event of his life, that is his encounter with Halit the Regulator, the founder of the Time Regulation Institute. The institute is part of the larger administrative body of the Turkish state, which is imaginary of course, um, that aims to modernize every aspect of the citizens' lives, including regulating their watches and clocks. With his employment in the institute, Harry's life shifts radically from the enchanted and stagnant world of his former milieu into a diligent and punctual order, in respect to which he always runs late. Tamponar, in all his works, explores the, explore the question of being in between two worlds, and here that is um, the traditional and the modern. 
and he envisions a synchronic whole, like the aforementioned watch that tells all times, rather than a synthetic unity, or what we call the universal time. Like the pocket watch of Harry's father, there is no universal time but coexisting temporalities, and as long as their plurality and inner continuity is not perceived, the watch will never work properly. For example, our modernism in Turkey is not merely a question of cultural difference. He thinks about modernity through questions of time and temporality. He's not merely concerned with Eastern and Western times. He's after what Ber Henry Bergson calls pure duration, and Tamponar is, is an adamant reader, reader of Bergson. For Bergson, the past does not simply precede the present, but coexists with it. The passing of time can only be conceived as a virtual coexistence of past and present, and not simply in terms of straightforward succession of chronological time. It is this continuity between the past and the present that influences Tamponar's conception of time. Tamponar argues against the developmentalist uh, narrative of history that dic dictates an absolute break with the Ottoman past and that organizes the present with a system of universal values. Tamponar, like Bergson, challenges the treatment of time as a series of distinct states. He wants to deregulate the quantitative organization of time and the way time is chronologically conceived, divided into and measured by quantitative units. And here the, the division being um, the the, the imperial past and the, and the uh, republican present or the future. So Tamponar had this brilliant idea of the Time Regulation Institute in order to caricaturize the state-initiated modernization and its alienating effects, particularly regulating, um, regarding society's relation to the past. In exploring the question of time deregulation, the novel revolves around two central axes, the political aspects of modernization embodied by the Institute and the subjective experience of Heidi who is unable to regulate or update, update his subjective time, who is unable to say, uh, he says, I, the, the, bliss, the bliss of being able to say, quote, now I'm a new man. Now that, the, now that we're modern, now that the republic has come, now we're a, we're a new man, uh, we're a new society. Tamponar considers the Kemalist revolution of the 20s and the 30s as a cultural rupture, an abrupt, abrupt transformation of a traditional society to realize a universal civilizi civilizing subject, project. The establishment of a modern secular order on social and cultural grounds such as custom, tradition, religion, art, and language results in a troubling epistemological duality where two incompatible worlds exist simultaneously. Um, traditional and modern, secular and Islamic, oriental and occidental, whichever you know, um, dualisms that you can think of. Um, for Tamponar, the key to the crisis created by this rupture is not to deny legitimacy to either one of those systems, but to recognize their simultaneity and multiplicity, <coughs> and to establish an inner continuity between them. In this respect, the question of time and temporality is a crucial one. He endeavors to, Tamponar endeavors to build a bridge between the late Ottoman past and the Turkey of tomorrow. He rejects the developmentalist narrative that presumes an ultimate break with what comes before and recognizes the persistence of an Ottoman heritage in modern Turkey. Hayri, like Joseph, is an outcast, a loser, and most importantly, a hopeless imitator. He is an unequipped, unsophisticated subject who stands in between two worlds. It is through the, his story of survival that we can explore the possibility of continuity. He represents the Bergsonian unconscious, the intuitive thinking that will grasp the continuous and indivisible in the experience of reality. For Hayri, this continuity is, quote, a matter of life and death. He has to bridge the past with the present in order to respond to the call of the future. Surviving the radical change is an ontological necessity more than a mere shift of values or of, of a mere shift of epistemological systems. In the face of the absurdity of the Institute's functionalist treatment of time, and his inability to adapt to it, he argues, no, this was not a question of, quote, no, this was not a question of lies and truth, it was rather one of to be or not to be, unquote. The idea of duration becomes an ontological question more than an epistemological one. The individual quote within the rupture will cease to have a life, a future if he does not take the leap to break with the past. This is the central product, uh, paradox of the protagonist and of the novel as well. The vital necessity and simultaneously the impossibility of uninterrupted relation with the past. The questions regarding time, change, and rupture is materialized in symbolic and metaphorical usage of clocks. Clocks gain multiple meanings throughout the text. They are personified, turned into objects of desire. They mimic and subdue their owners. Hayri adds, quote, 
Watches change their rhythms according to the prudence and rashness of their owners, and their matrimonial lives and political creeds. Especially in a society like ours, which has undergone successive reforms and taken gigantic steps forward, leaving behind whole castes of people and generations. It is only too natural to see the influence of these political creeds. There is no better place for these concealments and differences of idiosyncrasies and beliefs to become manifest than in our watches. Halid the Regulator is an arrogant entrepreneur, like Tobler, who has close relations with the bureaucracy of the New Republic. After meeting with Hayri, he invents and then establishes a Time Regulation Institute as part of the series of modernizing institutions of the state. Um, by the way, I'm reading this with all my seriousness in, you know, serious academic voice, but this, the novels, both of them are really very funny novels. Um, I'm sorry, I, I just cannot, you know, transfer that to you. He, um, so talking about the, um, the regulator here, um, the entrepreneur. He fosters in foster industrial work ethic, emphasizing both the national and personal need for modernization. Quote, we are performing a function and an important one. To work is to, is to be a master of one's time and to know how to make use of it. We shall inculcate into people's minds the consciousness of time. Unquote. The consciousness of time that the citizens are supposed to lack is that of the modernizing time. It's the scientific and standardized time that regulates everyday life. The Institute represents the impact of industrialism on temporal perception that was extended by mass production of clocks and watches. Hyre mentions the increased number of clock towers in the city with the ad advent of the constitutional era, while the regulator complains about the fact that half of the 18 million have no watches in the country. While the Halit the regulator's invention is a parody of the regulating practices of the Republic, of organizing people's lives according to the principles of modern values that generate temporal hierarchies between societies, between people, and within human psyche. Halit the regulator wants to regulate the citizens' perception of time to make sure that all citizens experience the flow of time in the same way. The Institute, at a symbolic level, is the unifier of a series of fragmented chronologies inhabited by different classes, groups, and individuals. It takes the modernizing discourse to its limits, to the point, sorry, to the point of absurdity with this big administrative body. Three management offices, 11 branches, 47 typists, and 270 controllers, controllers on the on the street who are checking your, your watch if if you know if if, if you're on time or not, um, and so on. Halit the regulator writes books called. Uh, social monism and time, and the, second, the second and society. Regulating the time becomes a way to regulate the society's relation to its past as a parody of the, the abolishment of the Islamic calendar or of the Arab, Arabic alphabet. The Institute's overemphasis on the exact measurement of time recalls Bergson's idea of mathematical time and immobility. In time and free will and later in duration and simultaneity, Bergson contrasts psychic time, duration, with clock time. The letter treats time as a measurable magnitude, a homogeneous entity, reducing it to a sim to simple movement of position, like that of the hands of a clock that divided into equal portion portions. For Bergson, what the clock count counts is immobility rather than time, the indivisible movement. Dividing time, in time into distinct states, like a clock, <coughs> is to count merely simultaneities. The qualitative organization of time therefore leaves no trace of the past. It sets up immobility as a, re as a reality, making it an absolute, like an absolute rapture. Hence, clock time serves for breaking up of time into immobile states that ruptures the continuation of what proceeds into what follows. At a symbolic level, this is what the Time Regulation Institute does as a modernizing body, to create a break or disruption in time where the past and present are distinctly separated. The clock or the watch is an object of time, an object that measures time, symbolizes a closure of time. It has rhythm and control. It regulates body and time, in this, and in this regulation, it mirrors an image of ourselves, our duality, which is captured between regulated time and inner, inner unregulated time duration. What Hayri and Joseph uh, resist, both Hayri and Joseph resist uh, calibration of time and its determinism that govern their lives. The haunting clocks of modernity in their stories epitomize mechanistic treatment of time and call for the notion of Bergsonian duration. We cannot measure, count, store, catalog, register, utilize, prove, or define what we experience as duration. 
a genuine temporality or real duration is in inherent in a conscious being. Drawing on the work of Tamponar alongside with his contemporary Walser, um, without taking recourse to cultural fundamentalisms or easy comparatism, comparatisms here, um, enables us to see the affinity in their notions of bureaucratic regulating time juxtaposed against the subjective but impersonal duration. Thank you.